Okay, part three of lecture 15 is when things go wrong. So we're going to talk about congenital malformations. So the word is kind of strange because congenital, you would think it means having to do with your genetics, right? It has to do with a genetic defect. And the problem is that sometimes congenital malformations are genetic problems, but sometimes they're not. So the true definition of a congenital malformation is that it's a defect or an abnormality that's present at birth. Regardless of the cause, it's just something that's already there when you're born. So congenital malformation is a defect that's present at birth. You would think of it as a birth defect right they're relatively common they occur in two to three percent of all live births most of them are relatively mild however but if you have a miscarriage or a stillbirth where the infant is born deceased then it's much more likely that there is a malformation because that's usually what caused the miscarriage or the stillbirth so most of these congenital malformations are minor in live births, like having an extra pinky finger, for example, but some can be severe and require intensive medical intervention. And some of them, even despite all the best medical care, are fatal. There are some conditions such as absence of a heart. <laughs> right? Um, it, absence of a part of the heart, technically. It's called left ventricular hypoplasia or hypoplastic left heart. So there's a, there are some things that there's just nothing that we can do for those uh, congenital malformations, and so some of them do result in, in infant death. So there are different things that can cause congenital malformations, and certainly the first one we think about is genetic problems or chromosomal disorders, and that is a sizable uh, majority of the number of causes of congenital malformations, but there can also be some physical and mechanical problems that occur in the womb, in the, inside the uterus, or sometimes there can be exposure to a teratogen, and a teratogen is something, it's some type of a substance, some type of a chemical compound that isn't really poisonous or dangerous to the mother, but can be dangerous to the developing fetus. Alcohol would be an example of this, right? The doses that are not dangerous to the woman can actually be quite dangerous to the fetus. And then finally, unknown. So in more than half the cases, we don't really know why the malformation happened. It just did. So we're going to focus on the first two of those, and I'm actually going to start with the physical or mechanical factors first. So mechanical factors that can cause congenital malformations. We're just going to talk about one example, and that's called amniotic band syndrome. So when the fetus is inside the uterus, it's in this amniotic sac, which is filled with fluid, which allows the baby to kind of move around and float around and stay nice and warm and cozy. Now, in this image, it looks like there's quite a lot of room. Normally, there's quite a bit less. But what you can see in this image are these fibrous bands of almost like scar tissue. We don't know why these form. Certainly, if there's some type of infection or inflammation inside the uterus, that makes it more likely. But these bands can form. And then as the baby's moving around, it can accidentally kind of get them wound around. You see how it's kind of wound around the baby's wrist here? to the point where then it cuts off blood supply to that developing part of the body. So that can result in malformations that are very mild. So if it's just the end of the pinky finger, for example, then you might just be missing a part of the end of the pinky finger. Or like this individual here, you're missing, you know, pretty much most of the hand, right? There's little tiny stubs of fingers, but um, no real wrist, no real hand to speak of. Or in some rare cases, right, the band can get wrapped around the baby's neck and the baby can actually uh, kind of basically choke itself to death um, and it can cause fetal death. But most commonly, if you see someone who has an arm like this, it's usually due to amniotic band syndrome. So that's the one example of a mechanical problem that we're going to talk about in this class. 
Next, we're going to talk about genetic or chromosomal disorders. And we're just going to talk about one in, in particular, which is Down syndrome, also known as trisomy 21. So that's going to be the example we're going to discuss. It is the most common of the chromosomal disorders. So Down syndrome, I mentioned it's called trisomy 21. Tri means three, like tricycle. Somy just means body, so it has three things instead of two. And so in Down syndrome, they have an extra chromosome 21. Instead of having two, one from a sperm and one from an egg, they ended up with three. And the thing about human genetics is having extra is not good, right? That causes things to go a little haywire. So the reason why this happens is because there's a mistake during the division, one of the divisions during meiosis. So if we look here, we can see, I'm going to change my color. So here is our first, we're getting ready for our first division, right? So they're kind of lining up. This is the actual first division right here, right? So they've already done duplication and crossover. So now they're doing the first division and look, Right, this little chromosomes, they were supposed to go over here, but they didn't. And so now in the end, we have these guys that have an extra and these guys that are missing one. So what happens is if you had an egg or a sperm that ended up not having a chromosome 21 at all, then the resulting zygote would not survive. If you have an extra chromosome 21 in your oocyte or sperm, it's almost always the oocyte in this case, then the resulting zygote ends up with three because you got two from the oocyte, one from the sperm. So I mentioned most commonly it is the oocyte that's the gamete that has the extra chromosome 21. And that's because you might recall that female bodied people are born with all of the oocytes they will ever have and they all sit around for our whole lives until that month that they get called upon to develop and mature. Whereas male bodied people are making brand new gametes all the time. So the older a female bodied person is, the higher the risk that this will happen. It's almost like because the eggs have been sitting around a long time, by the time you get to age 40, right, then we see this really exponential rise in the likelihood of having a child with Down syndrome, of making this mistake during meiosis. So you can also notice here that the inflection point of this curve starts to change around age 35. That'll be important when we talk about things later. Down syndrome affects about one in every 700 births. Um, so it's relatively common. So you probably have met people with Down syndrome. It's not all that unusual, right? So. What are the things that we can see in individuals who have trisomy 21, who have Down syndrome? What are the things that we see clinically or medically with them? Certainly, on average, their intelligence is significantly reduced. The average IQ of an individual with Down syndrome is 50. So to put that into perspective, normal adult average is 100 on an IQ test, and 70 is used as the cutoff for an intellectual disability. But the thing about Down syndrome is that although the average IQ may be 50, there are some people with Down syndrome who have an IQ of 100 or even higher. There's this very wide range of functioning, and it's really difficult to know where someone is going to end up. Now, obviously, if the average IQ is 50, then that means some people also have an exceptionally low IQ, right? Down in the 40s or the 30s or even below that. So some people are very severely impacted and some people are not very severely impacted in terms of intelligence. Wide range of functioning. There are some characteristic physical features, right? These are the things that when you look at someone, sometimes you can say, oh, I think that person has Down syndrome. So there are a few things. So epicanthic folds, what does that mean? This is in the eyes. So if you look at the inner corner of the eyes in a person with Down syndrome, that inner corner doesn't come to a point because there's a little fold of skin that comes across. 
you can see it, you can see it here. It doesn't reach a total little point. Now, that can also be seen in people with Scandinavian heritage. So that finding of an epicanthic fold of not having your eyes come to a point there near your nose is not in and of itself diagnostic of Down syndrome. They also tend to have a pretty flat nasal bridge, so that part of the nose in between the eyes is very flat and low down to their face. A tongue that protrudes, so just kind of when they're resting, the tongue just kind of is very far forward in the mouth, more so than in other folks. And interestingly, if you take a moment, look at the palm of your hand. Most people have three creases in the palm of their hand. Some people have two. People with Down syndrome, they have only one crease in the palm of their hand. So interesting. So they have that single palmar crease. People with Down syndrome have a high likelihood of having significant medical problems. So about half of them will have congenital heart malformations, often severe enough that they need surgeries even as infants in order to survive. Hearing problems are common, and an underactive thyroid is also fairly common. Interestingly, they also have very lax joints, um, so they tend to be kind of loose and floppy and uber flexible. Their muscle tone tends to be low, and because of that, it takes them a long time to develop the strength to walk as infants, and it takes them longer to develop certain motor skills and speech as well. Life expectancy for people with Down syndrome used to be quite low because we used to not be able to treat the congenital heart problems. Nowadays, however, we've gotten really good at treating a lot of these medical complications, and so life expectancy for people with Down syndrome is now age 60, which is wonderful and that they can often have a very long and productive life. It also presents a challenge because many people with Down syndrome are not able to live independently and live with their parents. If you're living to age 60, there's a decent chance that your parents may pass away before you do. And so that kind of creates a new challenge uh, for families with Down syndrome that didn't exist in the past when the life expectancy was quite a bit shorter. It's a good problem to have though. So, the last thing I'm going to ask you to do is to watch this video about some people with uh, Down syndrome. They have British accents, so I apologize in advance. It might take you a little while to pick up on what they're saying. Um, these are some various individuals who have worked as actors and uh, hairdressers, office assistants, uh, so very hot, what we would call high functioning. They tend to have pretty normal IQs, um, talking about some of the um, misconceptions that people have about Down syndrome. So the final part of this lecture for today will be the next piece, uh, 15D, where we're going to talk about screening tests for Down syndrome.